So I lived in Singapore for about 11 years during the 90s. I was the resident teacher at Amitabha Buddhist Center, or ABC as we call it. And during that time, we had quite a few um, visiting teachers, Tibetan lamas, because Singapore is kind of um, on the way between India, Nepal, and other countries like America, Australia, and so on. So a lot of lamas would be passing through Singapore, and we would invite them to teach at our center, which was really wonderful for all the students, but also for me. So during one such visit of a lama, we were driving home one night after he gave a talk in the city, and we passed through a red light district, of which there are several in Singapore. <laughs> and uh, so these are places where there are lots of uh, hotels where you pay by the hour, and um, karaoke bars, and on the sidewalks, lots of people milling around, including women with lots of makeup and skimpy clothing. So the traffic was quite heavy. It seemed like quite a popular destination. And so we were crawling along through the streets. The Lama was looking out the window. And after a while, he made a comment. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like how women become prostitutes because they have a lot of sexual desire. And normally, I don't express disagreement with teachers. I, even if I think something in, a, in disagreement, I usually keep my mouth shut. But on this occasion, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I had to say something. So I just found myself, it just came out. I said, women become prostitutes because of men's desire. And, <laughs> and the Lama didn't say anything. I had the feeling he was a bit surprised. And I was also kind of surprised that I just said this without thinking very much. And, and I wondered afterwards, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe it's not true. But thinking about it, I, I did feel it was uh, justified. Um, one reason is the law of supply and demand. So why are there slaughterhouses? Why are there butcher shops? Is it because animals want to be killed and cut up for human consumption? Probably not. Is it because the people who work in such places love that kind of work? Probably not. It's horrible. What I've heard, what I've read, it's horrible kind of work to do. So why? It's because people want to eat meat. There's a demand for meat, and so there's a supply for that. And lots of money, especially for the owners. Probably the workers don't get much money, but the owners of such companies, I think, they get quite wealthy. So I think it's the same with prostitutes. There's a demand, and they supply it. They can make a lot of money. Well, maybe, not necessarily. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I also, also, I had a conversation once with a woman, not in Singapore, but here in America. And I can't remember if it was before that incident with the Lama or after. Um, this woman worked for an escort service, um, although she was the receptionist. She was, uh, her job was taking phone calls and making appointments. But anyway, she knew the women quite well. And I'm not really sure about escort services. Apparently, sometimes they do sex, sometimes not. It, it depends on conditions. But anyway, she told me that the women do this for the money. That's, that's their motivation for doing that kind of work. Of course, as we know, there are many women and also children who are forced into prostitution, especially in countries like in Asia. Some are sold by their their families when they're children. Um, some are kidnapped and forced into this work by pimps and so on. So why do these things occur? Why do these you know, tragedies occur? And even in the case of women who choose to work as sex workers. So my inference tells me it's because there are lots of men with so much sexual desire that they're willing to pay for it and even do it illegally especially in the case of sex with minors. And is this the case with women? Are there male prostitutes to cater for women who have a lot of sexual desire? 
Are their children sold or kidnapped to feed women's sexual desire? I don't know. There might be some, but probably much fewer, far fewer. And in fact, I just looked online <laughs> to find information. And there was a report uh, from a, I don't know the name, Fondacion Celis. It sounds like it's in Europe. And the report was that um, worldwide there is an estimation of 40 to 42 million prostitutes. 80% of them are female. And they range in age between 13 and 25. There are an estimated 1 to 2 million prostitutes in the United States. It's probably hard to get exact numbers because many of them probably work illegally. And in a report published by the Juvenile Justice Information Exchange, 50% of the 100,000 children trafficked for sex are boys. So there are quite a few boys, but 80% female, 20% male. Okay. <clears throat> so this seems to be another stereotype about women in Buddhism, that women have a lot of uh, desire, sexual desire and thus um, pose dangers to men, especially to monks who are trying to be celibate. There may be some truth to it. There is a story uh, of the, at the Buddhist time of one of Buddha's disciples, one, one monk who encountered a prostitute who tried to seduce him unsuccessfully. <laughs> he was very determined. And I've also heard some contemporary stories. One Western monk that I know um, told me that he met a woman, a Western woman, who thought it was a great shame that so many good men had taken a vow of celibacy, and she made it her mission to try to dissuade them. I also heard a story from one of my teachers, a Tibetan lama, um, when he was studying in, a, in the monastery in India. He and his friends met this Western woman who was walking around the monastery, and they talked, and they asked her, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm looking for a husband. And <laughs> they tried to tell her, well, this is a monastery. We're monks. Maybe you should go to the Tibetan uh, settlement. She said, oh, I've been there already, but I didn't find any good men. All the good men are here. <laughs> so there may be some women who have this attraction to monks and wish to seduce them, to dissuade them from their vows. But I'm pretty sure that that's the exception rather than the norm. And that most women involved in Buddhist um, temples and centers and so on and so forth are respectful of monks and respect their wish to remain celibate and wouldn't try to dissuade them from that. So I think it's completely wrong to make a generalization that all women are starving for sex and want to seduce monks. And um, in this book, The First Buddhist Women by Susan Mercott. There's a whole chapter entitled Prostitutes, Courtesans, and Beautiful Women. And it contains stories of several women who were prostitutes or courtesans before they became disciples of the Buddha. And one of these is very interesting. I'll tell it on another occasion. A woman named Ambapali. Um, really interesting story. And the author, Susan Mercott, did quite a bit of research before writing the book. She studied Pali herself and worked with Pali scholars to translate the stories and the poems. But she also researched um, the situation of women at that time, attitudes towards women, possibilities for women, and so on. And she writes here that, you know, in the context of Buddhism, Women were believed to have an insatiable sexual drive. And she says, the scriptures speak of four things that are insatiable. The ocean, kings, brahmins, and a woman's lust. So how true is this? <laughs> Um, and she goes on to say, if we examine the words women use to describe themselves, like in the Tarigata, um, they don't indicate an obsession with sexual desire. The women of this chapter, presumably the ones with the most insatiable drives, 
refer to their desire no more frequently than other women in the Terigata, nor more often than monks in the Taragata. That's the collection of uh, stories about the, the monks. When we try to pinpoint the source for this assumption of women's insatiable sexual desire, we find it, in fact, to be the obsession of men, particularly of male renunciants. <laughs> she goes on to say, whereas Buddhist monks are frequently haunted by images of women or shaken in their resolve by thoughts of wives or lovers, the nuns do not speak of a comparable temptation by former husbands or lovers. The impression is that when these women had strong sexual feelings, they didn't project them outwards or blame men for them. Equally striking, the prostitutes, courtesans, and beautiful women's self-images do not seem to be based on extremes of fascination and loathing. When these women speak of their former profession or of their beauty, they do so straightforwardly. They seem comparatively at ease with themselves and with their sexuality. Consequently, they appear to be at ease with their decision to become renunciates without needing to express, express derision of the opposite sex, like some of the most extreme Buddhist monks. So anyway, she seems to be suggesting that this idea of women having insatiable desire is a projection by, by monks, by men. And I actually heard a story illustrating this. Uh, one center in Europe, um, there was a geshe who had been staying there for some time. And one day he called a meeting of the director and four female students of the center who had been assisting him with his meals and other needs and so forth. And at this meeting, he said he believed that these four women were sexually attracted to him. And they were all shocked and denied that it was true. And I think they were all married. One was, in fact, the director's wife. So both the director and his wife were present at this meeting, and they were really um, shocked. And uh, this unfortunate meeting eventually led to the Geshe's departure from the center. I'm not sure if it was his choice or their choice or it was mutual. But anyway, it, it just left a really kind of bad feeling in, in the minds of, these, of the people in the center. I can probably understand how the Geshe might have gotten that impression because he probably lived in a monastery since he was a little kid didn't have much contact with women. And even the women he did have contact with were probably Tibetan women who behave quite differently than Western women, especially European women. Um, so perhaps these women in the center were just very friendly and very caring, very devoted, very eager to help him with his needs. And he misinterpreted this friendliness for sexual or romantic feelings. So I can kind of understand his point of view. But I think there's probably also some projection. <laughs> it's so easy to happen. OK, so anyway, um, I'm just throwing this out. I don't know what solutions there are, except, uh, as the Dalai Lama said, we need to investigate statements that we find in the Buddhist text, the Buddhist teachings, or if they are expressed by Buddhist teachers or monks. Um, don't just take them as true, but examine them. Maybe we can do more research to, sec to check if, you know, if there are any facts about this. And I was thinking, too, it might be helpful to have some basic sex education classes in the monasteries. But um, that has to come from them. I'm not sure if they would agree if we proposed that. <laughs> but also, um, I think one thing we can do from our side, and this is being done, like here and many other um, Western Buddhist centers is to educate Western students about, you know, how to behave, how to act, how to dress, how to talk, especially with monastics. Because desire, sexual desire, can be subtle and hard to detect, and it may reveal itself in our behavior, even if we're not aware of it consciously. And then, of course, you know, the Dharma teachings and Dharma practices contain so many excellent methods to recognize desire in our minds, to recognize the faults that it can bring if, if it's used in harmful ways, 
and then to work on our mind so we can learn to reduce it or at least manage it and even use it in the path. You know, it's an opportunity to cultivate renunciation, determination to be free, to enhance our compassion for other beings who are suffering due to desire, and even understand emptiness, to look at the desire itself, the one who has desire, the object of desire, and see them all as empty of inherent existence. So there's lots of opportunities to work with desire and transform it, well, at least transform our mind into something beneficial to help us progress along the path. Okay, thank you.